Hey, what's up? This is Václav. So this is already third part of the five-part series about making automations in Home Assistant. Uh, so if you didn't watch the first two parts, you should pause the video and uh, watch them in here because it really makes no sense to start um, from the middle. Uh, so in the first part, we have uh, created our first automation from a blueprint which was delivered uh, with the Home Assistant. Uh, in the second part, we created our first automation uh, from scratch. Uh, it was a simple automation uh, triggered by a motion sensor and it was turning on a light uh, and turning off another light. Uh, and there was a condition that it's dark outside. Uh, so there was very basic automation. In fact, if you would watch that, you would think like, what was the point having home automation for such a simple scenario? You can buy a standard light in Home Depot, which does exactly that. Uh, in fact, uh, in the past, the uh, automations and home assistants, they were really limited like that. It was just uh, triggered by something that there was a condition, should it run or not, and then call services or a couple of actions. Uh, but that was it. And uh, so for that reason, many people didn't use uh, the built-in automations in home assistants um, for other things than some of those simple, uh, simple uh, if then do something. And we were using uh, other tools that are delivered uh, as an add-on to Home Assistant, such as Node-RED. Now, Node-RED is uh, quite powerful, actually, automation engine. If you use that, uh, good for you. I was using it as well. It's, it has nice graphical user interface. Uh, it uh, allows, it's quite powerful. It allows uh, connecting different nodes uh, and um, doing looping and branching. It's quite nice. I was using it myself, but then I stopped using it. And I had uh, three or four, maybe three reasons for that. I'd like to, sh I'd like to share those with you. Um, the first reason was, uh, I, I was, I ended up using three tools to do essentially the same thing, to automate things. I had the built-in Home Assistant automations for the simple stuff. And I used that because it was quick, it was simple, it was uh, very fast, very easy to do. So I used that. If it was getting a little bit more complicated, I was using the Note Red, where I was running some of those other ones. And uh, if it was getting even more complicated, then I was using the App Demon, uh, where I could do some more advanced scripting. In fact, it's programming in, in Python. But I use that for like uh, controlling the heating or, 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 or the shades, uh, the angle of the shades. I made some earlier videos about it if you want to watch that. So I had three uh, tools to do the same thing, which is not really a uh, smart thing to do. Uh, if, you, if, you have, uh, your, uh, if you have some, if, if you maintain some applications uh, in your home or in your company. Uh, it's making it too complicated, especially if you decide that you have one automation and you want to improve it and change it and then you realize that actually it's becoming too complicated for the tool you have and you want to change it to the next level tool and you end up rewriting it from scratch and then going back and forth between all those three different tools and you end up with kind of having similar services split across the services, uh, across the tools, depending on where you, write, where you wrote it and what they do. So it's kind of messy. Uh, and, and the other reason really is that uh, the automations in Home Assistant, they're actually much more powerful and simpler in certain things, especially in triggering the automations, because Home Assistant they can be triggered by lots of those internal events and they have access to all of these uh, powerful state machines and the templating and, and you can really tr trigger it by devices. And, and these things are not available to Node-RED. So in Node-RED often I ended up uh, doing this uh, regularly checking status of something. Uh, so there was like a time loop every five seconds check a status and if, it was, if the status was something then start the automation which is quite dirty. I don't like those. Uh, I would rather trigger things based on event. Um, and, and finally, the other thing is the uh, Node-RED was quite resource intensive. Uh, I used the Raspberry Pi and uh, it was using quite a lot of resources. They were quite uh, slow and using lots of CPU or memory. 
Yeah, so I didn't like that uh, either. So for that reason, uh, when Home Assistant came with this uh, more powerful set of scripting actions, and I find out that actually I can achieve exactly the same thing or even better with the built-in automations in Home Assistant, I got rid of the Node-RED and I'm now using only one or tool. And plus I have few things in AppDemon still, but, but they're kind of static. Um, so I'm using automations in Home Assistant Automation because it's quite powerful and it does all I need. But if you don't believe me, uh, let me show you. To show you all the possibilities offered by automation, it's best to show you the documentation. But where to find it? It's a little bit hidden, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the Home Assistant main website and uh, go to the documentation and from there there is a menu on the right side and from here uh, we have two ways of doing it. I can start on automations but from here uh, you can go to blueprints or the basics and from here uh, you would have to go into actions and from there to script syntax, which is kind of a lot of steps. So I'll show you easier way. Uh, what you could do is you can on the right menu go to the scripts and just click on the scripts word and you're on the same page essentially. And in here you see all the different uh, options. So call a service. We've done it. So you've seen that. So this is a menu, right? So we can go into details in here call a service for example light turn on this is what we used and there's the target so there is a light or in this case a group uh, and then there's all the supplemental data you saw that we showing it here in the uh, yaml format but you you saw it in the uh, menu in the application now the documentation still uses yaml to describe and document all the different services like call a service they're essentially the same as uh, in the automation graphical user interface. You see there is a call service, there's a choose, condition, device, fire event, repeat. These are all the same actions like you have here. There is an option, there is those three dots in the menu for all of these windows. And you can show it in YAML and it will then show you exactly the same as you have in the documentation. So if you want to learn the YAML language, this is one way of doing it. So from here, you can switch between the visual editor and the YAML. I don't know if they're going to ever change it. The graphical interface is kind of nice for creating the services because it gives you option to select the targets. You don't have to type them. Uh, and for some more complicated services, like if you would like to uh, choose and we will get to that. You can here choose different options and default actions. But it kind of takes a lot of space. Uh, so for those complicated things, it might be actually easier to show it in the YAML because this is actually equivalent of what you saw in here. So I think this is the reason why they still use that in the documentation because it takes less space and it's easier to show. Anyhow, so this is uh, to call a service, there is a bunch of different services. You can find them in the services call web page. So I'm going to just open it just to show you that there is a bunch of all different services. Also, if you go to the developer tools, services, there is a list of all the different services that are available. So this is uh, one way of doing it as well, looking what's out there and experimenting from here. But coming back to the script syntax, so calling service is first option. Then there is an option to define variables. This is actually quite useful uh, for the blueprints because what you could do is you can define variables in here and then you can use them in the templates later on. So this is the variable called entities and we're using this one uh, in the template later on. But we will get back to that later. There is an important note on scope of variables, which uh, I recommend you to read and review and consider it in your scripts. Well, essentially what it means is uh, the variables have a local scope. That means if you change it in the nested sequence block, the change will not be visible once you get out of this block. This is quite annoying, but this is uh, overall feature of the uh, Jinja language. So nothing new. Then we have conditions. Well, you might say this is nothing new, right? We know that each automation has a trigger 
condition and actions. But this is not the same. What this does is you can have condition within the action. So there's, you can enter condition in here as part of the action, which is actually quite useful because with this you're not limited to only one condition for the entire automation, but uh, you can have different conditions as part of a script. Quite useful, especially if you use loops where you can have a condition on a specific action. And if the condition isn't true, you just don't execute the action, but you continue with the rest of the script and in the other iterations of the loop. Delay, well, it's been here since the beginning. It's quite useful if you're doing something uh, that takes some time, like closing shutters and so on. So you can wait for some time for the action to uh, finish before you start some other. But even more interesting is wait, because what you can do with that is wait for some condition uh, to be met. So you can wait for trigger, wait for some state to change. Like for example, in our case, we have triggered the automation by motion and then we can wait for the next thing to happen. So we can wait, for example, for door to open, light to turn on or for another motion sensor perhaps to activate. And if it happens, we can do something. And if it doesn't happen, if the trigger times out, we can do some other thing, which is quite interesting. And then there are some variables. So when the wait loop finishes, you can do something based on whether the uh, action has been completed or how long you've been waiting. So there's an example. I'm not gonna do a demo of all of those because otherwise this video is gonna take forever. So I'm gonna just show you what's out there and if you're interested, you can look at that. Fire an event, uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, we were triggering the automation by event, but what we can also do is we can uh, fire a custom event perhaps to trigger some other automation or something else. So this is a uh, quite interesting feature as well. And now we're getting to the core, repeat a group of actions. So there is a couple of loops, there is a counted repeat. And uh, what this one does is it repeats uh, the nested sequence of events number of times. In this case, the number is a formula uh, which has count times two minus one. And the nested sequence of events is wait two seconds and then toggle light. So what this uh, specific script does is if I call it and say, I'd like to blink the light, let's say three times, it'll repeat toggle light number of times. And the number is three times two is six minus one. So it'll turn it on, off, on, off and on. So it'll blink three times in this case. There is a while loop as well. So this one repeats while certain condition is met. Or there is a repeat until. So this is similar as while, but this one is repeating while something is happening. And uh, this one is repeating until something happens. So they're quite similar. Within the loop, there are a number of variables. The first one is a Boolean condition, whether this is the first iteration of the sequence or not. And uh, then there is one for the last and the index automatically keeps increasing with each iteration. Now, finally, we're getting to probably my favorite action, which is choose. What you could do with that is you can branch the script into multiple different sequences. So what we have in here is if this condition is met, do that. If this condition is met, do this. And if none of the two conditions are met, do something else. So this is the default. So in the example, do something before nine in the morning, do something else between nine and 6 p.m. Otherwise, do something else. So this is quite powerful, in fact. I use it a lot and you can nest them. And with this, you can create quite complicated logic. So now that we have plenty of new toys, let's take it into the action. I'm going to go to this uh, auto machine we created previously and edit it. And I'm going to change it so it'll handle both uh, situations when the motion started to be detected and when it stopped to be detected. And uh, so I will delete those actions in here and I'm going to create them from scratch. And uh, in the beginning, I have one trigger currently, which is when the new motion sensor started detecting motion. So I'm going to add another one when it stopped detecting motion. But I'm not going to create this from scratch. I'm going to just duplicate the one we have. And I'm going to change it into when it stopped detecting motion. So I have two 
and I want to be able to differentiate them in the choose action I'm gonna uh, use down below. So I'm going to actually edit the trigger ID for the first one and I'm gonna call it start and uh, for the other one I'm gonna call it stop. So I have two triggers right now. Then there's a condition that it automation works only at night so uh, before sunrise and after sunset I'm gonna leave this one in. And for the actions I'm going to go for choose and I'd like to have two options. The first option is when the trigger it was triggered by the start uh, trigger and then I can add another trigger for when it was triggered by the stop trigger but instead of that I'm gonna use the default action so, so it's either start and if it's not start then it must be the second trigger so the stop. So I'll start with the start one and here I'm going to basically replicate what we had before. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call service light turn on. And here I'm going to pick the guest room. Then the second one was to turn off the light in the hallway. But in here I'm going to do it slightly better. Instead of service turn off, I'm going to actually add a condition. So here it's going to check if the state of the entity sensor people home so this sensor it's a template sensor which is counting how many people are home uh, and I'm not gonna explain you how it works right now we're gonna do it in the next part we're gonna be talking about templates so this sensor uh, is showing number of people at home and it has to be one so if there is one person at home it will continue otherwise it will stop here and if it's gonna continue then I'm going to call the service light turn off and here I'm going to pick the uh, hallway. Then there's the default action and the default one is going to be calling service light turn off in the hallway. So this is when the motion detector stopped detecting motion. So uh, I'm gonna save it and uh, let's recap. So this automation has two triggers. One is when the new motion sensor starts detecting motion and the second trigger is when it stops detecting motion. Then there is a condition that it only works during the night, so before sunrise, after sunset. And then for the actions there's a choose if it was triggered by the starting motion sensor then it will turn the light on for the guest room and then it's going to check whether there is uh, one person at home if not it'll stop here and if yes it will turn off the light in the hallway so that was for when it starts detecting motion and when it stops it will call the service light turn off in the hallway. So this is the visual editor I'm gonna also show you in the YAML which for many people it's intimidating but look at that I don't think it's that complicated. It might be actually easier to explain in here so there's two triggers the new motion sensor start detecting motion which is called start and no motion which is called stop. There's a condition before sunrise after sunset and then for the action we choose when the trigger was start then it will turn on the light guest room then there is a condition it'll check the sensor people home if it's one if yes it'll continue uh, and if it continues then there is a light turn off in the hallway so this was uh, for the trigger start otherwise if it's not triggered by start it will turn off the light in the hallway so i don't think it's actually that complicated is it so I'm gonna switch back to the visual editor. The other way to show this one is, let's make sure it's triggered, so now it's triggered. So uh, to show you the trace, and here on the left side you can actually see it very nicely in a graphical form, so there are those two triggers. The first is uh, when the sensor started detecting motion, and the second is when it stopped detecting motion. Then there is the condition before sunrise and after sunset, so you see this run at 12.25 p.m. 
actually ended in here because the condition hasn't been met, so the result is false. But if it was night, then there is this choose command, which has the default branch, and then the branch which is checking uh, that it's been triggered by the start trigger. If yes, it will call the turn on the light, and then there is a condition whether the state of the people home is one. If yes, it will continue to the next action, which is going to turn off the light in the hallway, otherwise it will end in here. And then the default action is turn off the light in the hallway. So I think this uh, debugger, so I think this debugger, I suppose in the last part, you maybe thought that this is quite complex and complicated and confusing. But from the three ways I just showed you how to explain what this automation does in the visual editor, in YAML, and in this uh, debug. For me, I think this one is actually the easiest to see and to understand. And you can also see uh, what the last automation did. And, and there are the previous ones where you could uh, check the previous runs as well. So that was the complex automation. I think we covered quite a bit today. So now you can write powerful automations in Home Assistant. I hope you like that. Uh, we have touched a little bit uh, about the templating, uh, those uh, curly brackets with expressions in them. I didn't really explain them because I'm gonna do that in the next video. Uh, there I'm gonna show you uh, more about those uh, templates and expressions in between them. And I'm gonna also show you how to use the developer tools, uh, how you can test uh, those expressions and it'll be quite cool. Uh, so I'm really looking forward for it. But until then, bye.